text this evening is Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, as you may know, beloved, contains the greatest passage anywhere in the Bible on Christ's humiliation and exaltation. Deep teaching, beautiful doctrine about our Saviour. And what might seem surprising is that this profound doctrine arises out of a very practical calling. The Apostle, at the start of this chapter, warns against divisions and strife in the congregation, against selfishness and vanity among the saints, and against the stinking attitude that I am better than others. And so he exhorts, if you know any consolation in Christ, if you have experienced any comfort of God's love, if you know any fellowship of the Holy Spirit, if you have any bowels and mercies, then fulfill my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, and letting nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind that each esteem other better than themselves, so that we're not concerned about our own things merely, but also the things of others. And then to press home this point further, the apostle holds up for imitation the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is explained in verses 6 through 8 in terms of his deep humiliation. He was equal with God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be clung to. He became of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, humbled himself, obeyed, obeyed to death, even the death of the cross. And this led to Christ's exaltation in verses 9 through 11, our text this evening, which we shall meditate upon together as we consider the exaltation of Jesus Christ, its glorious meaning, verse 9, and its universal confession, verses 10 and 11. The exaltation of Christ, its glorious meaning, and its universal confession. You may know, beloved, the exaltation of our Lord Jesus Christ began with his resurrection from the dead on the third day. This was in fulfillment of the prophecy, prophecy in the Old Testament, Psalm 16, Isaiah 53, Psalm 118, some earlier, and our Lord's own prophecy, he kept on saying, and I will be raised up on the third day. Christ's resurrection was also unique, for unlike others who were raised from the dead, there were a handful of them, Jesus rose by his own power, never to die again. Most importantly for us, the Saviour rose from the dead, not as a private individual, but as our covenant head and representative. So his resurrection is our justification. His resurrection power is our sanctification. 
His resurrection guarantees that we shall be raised from the dead on the last day. That's Lord's Day 17. God highly exalted His Son and His resurrection. This exaltation of Jesus continued with His ascension into heaven. There are others who have ascended into heaven. Enoch in Genesis and Elijah in 2 Kings. But neither of them were raised from the dead beforehand. Neither was brought into heaven before 11 eyewitnesses. None of them were received either by the divine glory cloud. Jesus went up into the sky, the first heavens, beyond the second heavens, and entered the presence of God himself, the third heavens. And again, the key point is that Jesus did not do this merely personally, but as our covenant head and representative. His ascension is our ascension. He went in to glory as our forerunner, assuring that we will enter within the field too. No privilege is too high for God's beloved Son and those who are engrafted into Him by faith. Having risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, Christ's exaltation continued and continues with his session at God's right hand. And there, Jesus sits on the throne which was typified by King David's throne. We're not looking for an earthly reign of Christ on a throne from Jerusalem and a rediscovered chair. This is what David's kingship was all about. David's kingship was earthly. Jesus has a throne that's heavenly. David reigned merely over Canaan. Christ has a universal dominion. And from this throne, Jesus executes the eternal decree of God by ruling over all things. In heaven and earth, the church and the world, for as Revelation 5 puts it, no one else was found worthy. The Apostle makes the point in Philippians 2 verse 9 that this was God's action and doing. God hath highly exalted him by raising him from the dead, by raising him to heaven, and by seating him on the throne of the universe. God hath highly exalted his son Jesus by giving him joy and glory above all others. Joy, that's the teaching of Psalm 45, thou hast anointed him with the oil of gladness above his fellows. Jesus endured the shame of the cross for the joy which was set before him. Hebrews 12. In John 17, Christ's high priestly prayer keeps mentioning that Jesus is looking forward to the glory which the Father would give him. The glory which he had with the Father before the world was. And which he shares too with the saints. The sort of glory that was revealed at Christ's transfiguration. God also exalted the Lord Jesus by filling him with the Holy Spirit without measure. So that Jesus became the quickening spirit who gives life to all of the elect. 
the Psalm 68 puts it, who also gives spiritual gifts to his people by conquering Satan and handing out the plunder, so to speak. You know too, beloved, that part of Christ's exaltation was God's setting him as the head of the church. The king and saviour of the greatest organism and institution in the history of the world. The one holy Catholic and apostolic church of the elect Jews and Gentiles. And as king and head of the church, Jesus is exalted such that he gathers and preserves and defends to the bitter end his church. He adds to her such as she be saved. He gives her office bearers for her good. And in so exalting Christ, God has made him the object of the church's the church militant's faith and hope, so we believe into him. We look for his return. And God has made Christ the object of the love and worship of the church militant fighting on earth and the church triumphant which rests from its labours already. So that all the holy angels of God too adore him. Part of this magnifying of Christ on God's behalf was his entrusting to Jesus the keys of the kingdom of heaven as well as the keys of hell and death. <coughs> so if Jesus controls when and how we die and where we go after we die with the keys of hell and death and graciously with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. God in his throne in Jesus, Psalm 110 verse 1 states, wills to make all of Christ's enemies his footstool. So that Christ on the great white throne rests his feet upon all the wicked who oppose him, his reign and his word. In short, God has highly exalted Jesus Christ by giving him Quote, a name which is above every name. The obvious question is, what is this name? <coughs> Some say the name is Jesus. The argument runs along these lines. Verse 9, God has given him a name which is above every name. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Others say that the name given to Jesus is the Lord. They look more to verse 11 than verse 10. Verse 11 says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3 states that no one can say that Jesus is the Lord truly from the heart but by the Holy Ghost. One could also too argue that the name which is above every name is Lord and Christ. I'm thinking here particularly of Peter's statement on the day of Pentecost that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified both Lord and Christ. So is it Jesus? Is it Lord? Is it Christ? Well, there's a sense too, a major sense, in which Jesus receives all three names, Lord, Jesus, Christ. During his earthly life, So how then could we say that God gives Jesus a name above every name upon his exaltation when he was already accorded those names during his life on earth? 
I take it this way, beloved, you can judge this for yourself. Rather than a specific word, Jesus, or Lord, or Christ, the name that God gave Christ at his exaltation indicates his supreme rank and glory as the sovereign ruler. Christ's name, his power, his authority is above every name or power or authority. Ephesians 1 verses 21 and 22 is similar. It deals also with Christ's exaltation. God exalted Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 20, by raising him from the dead, resurrection, by sitting him at God's right hand in the heavenly places, his session on the throne. But then especially this, on this throne he is far above all angelic powers, here classified as principality, power, might and dominion. And he is far above every name that is named, that is, every power and authority, both in this age, the world from the creation or fall, to the second coming of Christ, and over that which is to come, the eternal state. And so God hath put all things under his feet. And God has given him to be the head, ruler, controller, governor over all things, the entire universe, to the church, which is a data of advantage, so that Christ's rule over all things is for the good of his body mystical body of the Lord. Now we need to understand this word wherefore at the beginning of Philippians 2 verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The word wherefore here indicates that Christ's exaltation is not merely chronologically after his humiliation. It is after it in point of view of time, but that's not all there is to it. The word wherefore particularly teaches us that Christ's exaltation is the reward for his humiliation. Very easy to grasp the Spirit's teaching here. Jesus Christ, verse 8, was in the form of God. Everything that God was, is, he was, is. But though he was in the form of God, equal with the Father and the Spirit, power and glory, he became a man, became a servant, with no reputation, humbled himself, obeyed the Father, died even the death of the cross. Wherefore, as a reward, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So that Jesus Christ is worthy of this exaltation. I use the word reward, that's appropriate. But it's not only a reward, because we receive rewards. Christ earned it. Whereas we don't teach that we earn rewards with God. Christ even merited this reward. We certainly don't merit anything good. Christ merited it. That's biblical, reformed, confessional language too. And Jesus Christ, unlike us, was able to earn and merit with God because he's the eternal Son of God in his person. Unlike us. He came to earth from heaven. You didn't. 
I certainly did. He became a man by an act of his will. You did. But there he is, the eternal son, choosing to become man and entering a world like this, willingly from the outside, coming to earth, putting himself freely under the law that he might keep the law and earn and merit with God for the salvation of the church. Things that we could never do. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And if God exalted his son and Jesus is worthy of it, let us exalt him too with our words, in our hearts, in our homes, and throughout our lives. Now we need to be clear at this point, especially, what we mean when we speak of Christ's exaltation. Jesus was not exalted as to his divine nature. He who is the most high cannot be exalted. He is the most high already. He who bears the name and nature of God as God the Son cannot be given a name which is above every name. He is God. God isn't given anything. Jesus our mediator and saviour was exalted as to his human nature. And this makes sense too. He was raised. He ascended. He was seated at God's right hand with respect to his manhood. He was given joy and glory and the church and universal dominion according to his human nature because he wasn't and couldn't be given any of those things with respect to his divine nature, because he had all those things anyway. As the sovereign, the sovereign God. In fact, both of Christ's states, his humiliation, everything before his resurrection, and his exaltation, everything after his resurrection, both of Christ's states are according to his human nature. If you think of Christ's humiliation, his lowly birth, that's his human nature, his humility and obedience as a human, his death, he didn't die as to his Godhead, his crucifixion, all happened to him as a man. Likewise, with his resurrection, coming now to his exaltation, he was raised in his body, human nature. His bodily ascension came next, human nature. He seated at God's right hand, according to his human nature. Christ's humiliation and exaltation pertain to him according to his human nature. Because God is unchangeably blessed and so can never be in a state of humiliation and can never be in a state of exaltation. He can't be humble or exalted because he's God, immutable, perfect, <coughs> blessed. verse 9 and its tenses <coughs> clear sorry too that Jesus Christ is already highly exalted right now he has a name above every name it was given to him 2000 years ago Jesus Christ is Lord that's always been the confession of the Christian church 
from the beginning of the New Testament age. This is the case then, but this is not acknowledged. Most are in rebellion against this claim. Most live in denial of this most basic truth. Not everyone believes and confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. There are many, even today, who have never heard of the name Jesus Christ. There are others who know the words Jesus and Christ in the British Isles too, and they really have little idea what the words mean. Some sort of swear word. That's about it. For others, Christianity means Roman Catholicism. Others are members of false churches. Others are hypocrites in true churches who claim to follow Christ but in reality are unconverted. And then you can add to this the demons. They don't gladly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and worship Him. And there are those too who are yet unborn and unconceived. So, this is the drift of this text. God has highly exalted Christ in the past, two millennia ago, especially through his resurrection and ascension and session on the throne of the universe. God has done that in the past. And God has done that in the past with the purpose that he will exalt his son still further in the future. Verse 9, God also hath highly exalted Jesus and given him a name which is above every name, that indicating purpose, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And that verse 10 and verse 11, those two verses refer, as you will readily appreciate, to the great judgment day at the end of the world. God has exalted Jesus so far with the purpose that he will exalt him yet further on the last day. What will happen? First of all, all will be assembled. Jesus Christ will return in great majesty with his holy angels and the glorified saints. He will raise the dead, godly and ungodly. The righteous angels will assemble those alive at Christ's coming, both the worshippers of the beast and the poor, beleaguered, persecuted remnant that are still hanging in there. In other words, every human being who has ever or will ever live will be there, godly and ungodly. And all the angels, fallen and unfallen, all will be assembled. And all will be assembled so that all will bow to Jesus Christ, acknowledging that he must be worshipped. And this is very clear and obvious proof of Christ's daily. Good text amongst all the things to keep in mind if ever you to be the heretical Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm thinking here especially of Isaiah 45, verses just before the passage we read this morning, the great gospel call. Isaiah 45 verse 22 Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself and only God swears by himself. I have sworn by myself the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me God shall Every knee bow, 
and every tongue swear. Unto me, says God, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. And swear, take an oath, that I alone am God. Romans 14 quotes this passage from Isaiah 45. <coughs> Romans 14, 10 through 11 and 12. An argument dealing with Christian liberty. Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set up not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, quoting Isaiah 45, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We give account to God, we confess to God at the judgment seat of Christ, for he is God, he is Lord, we're accountable to him. And then here again in Philippians 2, 10 through 11, Paul quotes, or at the very least alludes to Isaiah's prophecy. Every knee shall bow. Some, of course, will bow willingly. The knees of the holy angels and of the holy church. Others will bow unwillingly. Reprobate men and angels. But every knee shall bow. That's sure. At the name of Jesus, every knee should buy of things in heaven, the glorified saints, holy angels, and things in earth, those living with Christ's return, and things under the earth, those in hell, who died in unbelief. And all those who are assembled shall not merely bow religious veneration of Christ as God and Lord, but they shall all confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amongst the wicked on that day shall be Annas and Caiaphas and Pilate who condemned him, Judas who betrayed him and in guilty remorse went and committed suicide. All the false prophets will be there Balaam, Buddha, Muhammad, dozens upon dozens and dozens of the popes, all those who hated Jesus Christ, like Hitler and Stalin and that wretch Gandhi, all those who attacked the scriptures, all those who persecuted the church, all impenitent liars and thieves and blasphemers and fornicators, idolaters and all unbelievers. Antichrist too will bow the knee and confess that Jesus Christ was Lord and that though he held great sway for a short time he was a liar and a cheat. Satan too will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and we have sort of hint of that in the gospel accounts when the demons which were driven out of those possessed, admitted, Thou art Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they'll hate, but the confession will be drawn from them. It will be irresistible, but not irresistible grace. And on the other hand, with great joy, all the godly shall confess him. Michael and Gabriel and the holy angels, Adam and Enoch and Methuselah and Noah and 
patriarchs, the godly saints in Old and New Testaments, the martyrs, the confessors, all those who fought a good fight for whom Jesus died, who confessed their sins and fled for Christ as their only hope. Faithful covenant children will be there, now mature, they're not going to remain children in the eternal state. Godly wives will be there. Single saints will make this confession. Office bearers who were faithful. Holy fathers. All who believed and loved and obeyed the truth and honored Jesus Christ who loved not their own lives. And the point here made so powerfully in Philippians 2 is that this day will be public. This will be the most public day and the most public event ever. This confession made of men and me will be universal. This will be the only day before or since when all rational moral beings, all angels and men, will be in one place at the one time they've all come, whether they wanted to or not, to glorify Jesus Christ. He has summons them, and they will come. On that day, truth will be enthroned. The truth about Jesus. The truth that was denied, buried, hated, blasphemed, slandered, and reproached day in, day out, for thousands of years <clears throat> as the world suppresses or holds down the truth in unrighteousness. And there will be no scoffers or deniers on that day. And all those who are outside of Jesus Christ should bow the knee now and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord now. Because all will have to do it, there is no escape, sooner or later. You do it now, enjoy, or else you do it on the judgment day, to your everlasting loss, every knee shall die. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All must stand before Creator God and answer. In Philippians 2, this is so typical of Scripture, states the purpose of all this. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's why God has not been receiving glory from the mouths of his rational moral creatures for 6,000 years. He is zealous for his glory. He will see to it that everybody confesses that he is glorious and that his son, Jesus, is Lord. This is the great theodicy, the vindication of God. When all the wicked aspersions and attacks upon him, that he's not just, he's unfair. Where's the proof? He didn't really make the world. His dealings with men aren't right. I don't like what he does to my life. He will be cleared of all wicked aspersions. He will be declared perfectly just and glorious. The rebels will be crushed and become the footstool of Jesus Christ. And all will be blinded by the infinite majesty of the triune God. Jesus humbled himself. Wherefore God has exalted him very, very highly with a name above every name, with the purpose that he will exalt him yet higher at his return, so that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess so that God finally is glorified in the confession of all rational creatures. He is 
truth and that they are wicked. And then he will say, now that you've come to admit that, depart from me, ye cursed, to everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And come, come, you righteous, you sheep, chosen before the foundation of the world, to the kingdom that I have given you in my Son. Amen.